So, Jim, here we are talking about improvisation, allegedly. Hi, Ronan. I'm talking about improvisation with you because we're improvising. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I'm, right I'm, now. Where's my, where's my script? Hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I was thinking about this before we talked, and, you know, I'm thinking about what what that is. And um, just a little bit of an interesting for me, uh, you know, is thinking about this in terms of because it's a thing that I, I kind of, not, I won't say wrestled with, but basically when I came up, I was playing with guys who played bebop in a in a situation where you were supposed to know standards, where the idea of what was called free music was described as tennis without a net. I remember all of this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, complete nonsense, you know, right. fakery, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I was... 1920 i was playing with these great players and there was you know there wasn't an there wasn't an opposing viewpoint i'll put it to you that way but mm -hmm. I, you know and, and i started to play with a trio in, in in which case there was a guy who was into this and we we dabbled in you know playing things without any preset thing and then years later and i got into it and then years later i was lucky enough to play in a trio with steve Arguelles, and he completely opened me up to you know you know other ways of thinking let's put it to you that way Right. And and I realized, Jesus, this is actually really hard. <laughs> this is really hard. You know, just the idea of just making something up. And he was so spontaneous and, and everything. And it, it didn't. And it, what was great about him was it kind of didn't matter what you were playing. You know, it could end up in any direction, depending on what happened. And that was that was the way he was. So then and then I really got into it. And, you know, and, and since then, I've done a, a lot of that kind of playing. And, and at the same time, I describe my roots as being in playing in, you know, more standard context. So what about you in terms of, you know, where you came out of and how was it was it there from the very beginning, just the idea of being completely spontaneous, regardless? Or was it something that kind of grew from a background that you had, you know, a different background that you had? I mean, different phases. Uh, the thing is, I, I think like most kids, you you get together and you jam first, right? So I remember getting together with another drummer friend of mine with an electric bass, a borrowed microphone and effects pedals when we were 12. And we would record free improvisations. We didn't call it that. We would just jam. Yeah. But like screaming and we blew the bass amp up by accident and, and, you know, two drum sets in a room in my mom's house. Um, so I think the idea of sitting down and just going, you know, without any one or any particular thing in mind was always sort of around. And even when when we had learned to color within the lines of big band music and, and, and jazz standards and things like this, you would go to, you would visit Cornish College of the Arts with someone like Jerry Grinelli. Right. And I remember sitting in in a class with Brad Shepik and Jerry would say, okay, you know, let's play all the things you are or something like that. And then we do it again and he would take away the time and just say, play off the idea of what this is. And so there were different ways of approaching this idea of what improvisation or maybe even the word more free improvisation or freeing up of improvisation mm -hmm. from one context to another. I mean, looking back, like to me, that wasn't a big deal. So when I got to the East Coast in college, you really saw this division between this is jazz and this is this is for rock. Uh, and then, you know, you were considered an out cat, out cat, if you did anything that wasn't in a very clear form or style. Mm. Um, and even now I'm still labeled as a avant-garde drummer by certain people, which is so so bizarre to hear somebody say, but I think for, for depending on what tribe you run with, that's totally okay. You know, it's just the way we describe things. But for me, uh, I don't know how any of this makes sense unless I approach it as an improviser. Even playing, even going back and thinking of like when I have to play something in a very clear manner or style, I, I don't think that's exactly where I would use all my improvisational skills first. You know, like you're really trying to hear something and, 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 and play it. Yeah. Which then, I mean, not to jump to the next subject but i question then what improvisation is in the first place regarding this music because uh for me it still boils down to spontaneous composition 
Hmm. Because you're making choices. So yeah. I've really been on that, feeling that for a good 15 years now, like, okay, it's, you can call it what you like, but you're, what you're really doing is making decisions because the music doesn't play itself. Yeah. And you own every sound or every silence you make uh, the minute, the, when the frame of the music begins. Yeah. You know, so, wow, all of a sudden there's nothing free about that. The pressure's on to be a composer every yeah. second. I mean, it, it, you make a decision, you're making decisions. I yeah. mean, regardless of the context, once you, once you commit to a note, you've actually made decisions. There's nothing free about that. Or there's nothing in the sense, I guess, in the sense of random, you know, it's not random, you know, the instrument doesn't play on its own. And, and it, there's an interesting, I remember years ago talking to Steve Coleman and he made a great point. I thought, he said, you improvise your life. He said, you get up in the morning, which sock do you put on the left or the right? He said, hopefully you don't have a decision made before you do it, you know? And, <laughs> and you know, the, when you get down to the kitchen, do you put on the toast first every time? Maybe some people do, you know, we, we know people like that, but most people don't, you know? So in the tiny, in the tiny minutiae of our lives, we improvise all the time in these tiny little things. And so the nature of human beings is to improvise. It's not to do exactly the same thing. And in fact, many dystopian stories, you know, and films have been made about people who are like robotic, you know, marching to fight, you know, that whole thing is considered to be, you know, uh, um, like dystopian, like horror, horror film stuff. But, um, you know, so this idea that, that, you know, the description of that, as I said, that the bebop guys used to give me a tennis without a net was the idea was that, you know, there's no challenge to that. You know, that's kind of what's underneath that because you're not playing changes and you're not playing. Time yeah, that's, that. yeah, that's all yeah. that stuff, you know, and, and you were lucky enough to have Jerry Grinelli to challenge that idea. Whereas it took me a bit longer, you know, because, but although, as I said, I fairly early on, I did start improvising with these other guys, um, guitar player, Tommy Hofty and a drummer called John Wadham, who, who was totally steeped. John was totally steeped in, in the tribal language, as I've heard Keith Jarrett call it, you know, which I think is a great name for it, tribal language of jazz. So, so of that type of jazz. So, so basically John played with Maynard Ferguson, he played with Art Farmer, you know, and he was like a, but he was totally into trying this shit out. Now I have to admit we weren't, the best at it because we approached it from a kind of i think yeah i think there's a kind of a bebop way of trying to play free you know what I mean? it's like you're trying to make shit happen in a in a kind of organized way which is not really the thing and it was only as i said for me it's really only when i got with steve and i watched him every night and he forced me to you know the way he i just realized after a while this guy is just has no plan you know, like when he starts to play, he has no plan. And from then on, you know, I, I really got into it then. And of course, um, you know, and of course, working with, you know, going to Banff and seeing Dave Holland do his thing, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. So I, I woke up to it a bit. But yeah, I think the idea of this, this idea is an interesting one, the one the tribal language idea, right? So because, you know, because what, how much is improvised and how much is not improvised and does it matter? You know, that's, that's, that's to me is a kind of a question that, that later on I, I started thinking about. So you hear guys, you know, and they're unbelievable at playing changes, right? But you kind of know they have what Lee Konitz calls a lot of stuff. And he didn't use the word stuff as a compliment. <laughs> you know, he has a lot of stuff. You know, that was not, that was mm -hmm. not, having read Lee's biography, the interview book, I'm, I, I don't know if you know it, it's fantastic, but he talks about that a lot, stuff. So when a, a guy who has a lot of stuff, how much is he improvising or does it matter? You know, is he speaking a tribal language as Keith Jarrett says, and he's telling the stories of that tribal language, you know, do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, burning swing over changes. The guy's got great swinging phrasing, but you could honestly say there's probably not, you know, the percentage of personal language in that where it's not somebody else's filtered through this guy is probably very small. So in that a, thing, are they improvising? That's the, that's, that's the question. Right. And obviously when you're talking about something that makes a known tribal language or style, the question then is when you're, when you're speaking this language, right? you're speaking English, how much are you improvising? Blah, blah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, a, yeah. it's like, uh, are we always re, you know, what percentage of it that we're actually so like i have a i'm working on a project with some young guys in berlin and you know the we're starting from that 
very fast swing sort of tribal language. The question and, and is really like, once you start there, where does it go? And what, and how do you insert yourself in this sound? And that's the challenge, like, okay, so uh, the reason why we're doing this is that these cats are young and burning. You know, they have, they have this energy and this curiosity and skill set. And I'm coming at it from a place like I've already been here more than once, but this is interesting right now because I need a challenge. I need, I need what this physically demands of me. And I need to psychologically put myself in this arena and, and make a game in a way. Mm. And only when you're there, and we'd had our first gig already last summer. Uh, and as soon as I got on stage and we started this, like something, something we just screamed out like, okay, this is so dumb. This is like so wrong. <laughs> so what Why makes it? Why, huh? Why do you think that is? Because I'm, you end up playing at an idea. It's like, a, it's like, remember, a tribal language also might imply you reading from a script. Yeah. You know, here's the way the fast swing goes, and it goes really well like this. And so you start reading the script, and you're like, this is, this is so stupid. I've read this a thousand times, and this is not me. So yeah. how do you make it us? You know, how do we... And that instinctually, the answer was to really like drop all the plans we had. And, and I mean, and I just, I refuse to even make a cue for the rest of the gig. And we literally morphed the rest of the, and then it had that feeling like it was living. And every decision that was made with language was spontaneous. Right. Like it didn't have to go to any particular place. Yeah. Now that sounds maybe not so different or maybe subtle, but I think that's what we're talking about when we're dealing with tribal language. Like, like you say, how much is it really improvisation? Well, um, this is why I think a certain sound or a language doesn't go out of style in that way. Like there's always, you can take up any, any language and, and, and find your way with it. Right. You know, um, and it's and, and I think what's interesting is then how each person or band interprets or creates or uses whatever part of this language that is there. You right. know, it's really more like like uh, poetry. Yeah. If language is, you know, if a, if, if a treatise is very literal wording, what's a poem exactly? It uses the vocabulary and creates an impressionistic cool. result. So then you could really question, is it this style? Is it this tribal language? Not really, but it's coming out of it or it's influenced by. So I don't know what this band will do yet, except we're starting with this language. Mm. So we'll decon and, and including Steve's language as well, um, including shape and, and, and really all that really implies is shape. Mm. Yeah, shape and good. maybe a bit of pocket. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, with Steve, it's, got, it's definitely got a bit of pocket, that's for sure. Um, yeah, because I, I read a book that really made me think a lot um, um, about five or six years ago called, um, I think it's called The Music Instinct, and it's by a guy called Philip Ball, who's a, you know, he's a he's a writer on, you know, and I you think he's an academic as well. And, but basically, he's talking about the the human impulse to create music, and he, he looks in, he looks at rhythm harmony melody and you know all over the world not not in any style but it, but he talks also about evolution the idea of of you know uh, of a lot of things that are common in music are due to evolutionary reasons it's really interesting and it's very interesting but one of the points he makes is that and this is this, he said wide intervals will never be popular this is a really fascinating <laughs> one right so wow. i think we found that out i think we have found that out Why and he talked, in, okay well, he popular talked, he talks about predictability as being the ability to predict as being hugely important to human evolution and being one of the reasons why we dominate the world, because building technology is based on the idea of predicting. If I do this, therefore that. And he, he takes that back to the like prehistoric times and how this would have worked in hunting, you know, the ability to predict where the animal is going to go and you'd send Fred down there with the net, you know, whereas when apparently when a dog chases a rabbit, but a, a rabbit runs behind a tree, the dog goes, it's disappeared. It's a miracle. They can't predict, you know, they, they can't figure it out. And, and, and babies 
can't this is the thing that they evolve as they get a little bit older that's why you can play that stupid game with this very small child of hiding behind a towel and go peep and they roar laughing and you just yeah, yeah, as yeah. As they, right because they're as gone they, now they're you, back. You just, holy shit what again oh my god so so he makes the point that predictability is a is a, and and the idea of of context is is a huge part of human evolution so he also mentions he brings in animals again like a dog has very little appreciation for a sunset for example you know dogs don't look at a sunset and go holy shit that's amazing because they can't do context like that so they don't the whole thing of looking at a landscape and the beauty of it is is you see how the sun and that comes there and you're you're and he, he makes the point that the human brain is contextualizing every second you know it's like mm -hmm. robocop or something it's doing this thing it uh, you're watching your peripheral vision or taking in stuff that's around you you can't help it it just goes on all the time right. so right. he gets to the point that um one of the things that humans like because of this evolution is predictability which is why he, and he goes into he goes into pop songs and he says you know he asks you to check them out yourself the vast majority of them say will not have a wider interval than a sixth and, and usually they step up to the sixth by scale steps and uh, it's either scale steps or close intervals and they're all quite short so it's very quick to predict you, you're very quick to predict with these things and he says as soon as you start to displace by octave you know the thing goes goes to hell in a handcart and he talked about an experiment where they played nursery rhymes for people and randomly got the computer to move stuff by octave and i was like you know pop goes the weasels people didn't recognize the tunes they were like right never They're displaced yeah yeah so he, he gets into that point that human beings in their lives generally like predictability and therefore stuff that breaks out of that thing um is never going to be as popular as stuff that's predictable i mean you know it seems kind of obvious but it's very interesting if you kind of what he well, for me anyway what, what he was kind of centering that in was like an evolutionary thing that it's it's not this is not just because oh, if everybody listened to jazz from the you know of everyone then they'd all love this shit you know they'd all love that all that stuff it's uh, which was a thing that you know you often hear bandied about which is of course true if people were exposed to a wider range of music from a younger age blah 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 but it's highly unlikely that it will change that so a lot of people for them the best musical experience and you get this in jazz too you you know yourself where people want what they know so they go and they say and you're playing it and you were saying talking about that you know the you're considered like an out cat by not doing this thing that's exactly the point you know that oh look he's the you know he's a weird guy because you're because the predictability of what you should be doing is what would make you an inside guy and the guy who knows the shit mm -hmm. so i remember when i did my thing years ago with with tom rainey and julian and and rick peckerman it was all music of charlie parker but i'd done all kinds of stuff with it you know like very many different things and a guy came up to me and he said, I really, I really was hoping you were going to play this stuff in the style of Charlie Parker. And that's what he said to me. I said, well, I said, you know, to be honest, really, if you really want to hear that, you'd be much better off listening to Charlie Parker. He's much better at it than I ever will be, ever. You know, so, so, but that is a point there because people say, well, there are people who love improvising in jazz. They love jazz because that's why they love improvisation, but they kind of don't because they want they still want it's a different kind of predictability but it's nevertheless a predictability mm -hmm. you no know, i would that, believe so i but maybe that comes about back to like pop you like predictability and popularity okay so a band like deerhoof is popular because they surprise people mm -hmm. and people go to the gig like all their they don't repeat things two or four times they repeat things three times so that always leaves you sort of guessing, mm -hmm. you know, they, they kind of have this commercial approach to things where they'll, they'll have a musical fragment that's repeated like a hook, but after two times, they'll do it three times. So there's an expectation for a fourth, but that's thwarted because it's only three times they go to the next hook. And that's wow. sort of, it, I don't know how that's, they've, I've heard Greg talk about that a little bit, um, but that's half the fun of listening to a band like this is that you don't know what's going to happen and you see the audience respond to shifts and changes but do you, um, they, let me just ask you about that sorry to interrupt but i there's always going to be people who will respond positively to that right obviously you're one of them because you yes you know, you're, and you're in that field right and so am i um but you know, can something like that, can, you know, I guess we, we can't answer this, of course, it's kind of a stupid question, we're going to ask it anyway. You know, can that kind of thinking be 
made into a much bigger thing with the listening audience or will it always be marginalized even within you know a, a, it's all relative you know the people who'd like to compared to beyonce for example you know i know there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on with beyonce of course not, of course you know, it's one you know marge well the word marginalized you know the interesting thing about facebook and instagram culture is that nobody's marginalized mm -hmm. You know, everyone's a star. Yeah. Everything that everybody does is great in some way and not in the margins. So now we're back to tribal. Mm. So the tribe of people who like surprise, who like shift, who like questions when they listen to music. Yeah. To me in this world now where everybody's a star, well, if there, if everyone's a star, then I just need to find my tribe. I need to cultivate this posse and I'm in and this idea of what's popular or what's comp or like we, we, this idea of wanting it to be bigger than it actually is. Mm. I mean, there's always, I think if you, if you look at the way that art has been capitalized, I mean, you want to be loved, right? You yeah. wanna you wanna be loved by the masses so you can take your band and go play somewhere in a big place and get a lot of you know I mean I guess in some way right so we think yeah. that the way to do that uh, or at least the models in the past when you see Miles Tony Ron Herbie and Wayne playing in a packed theater and they're doing the outest stuff for two hours straight yep yeah. or the video where they're in Sal Playa with Jack and and Chicory and they switch instruments for half the yeah. gig. Okay, yep. things were different. The world had a little bit more open mind about these things. And now let's say for whatever reasons it's closed. And now it's 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 even splintered into everyone's a unique entity in their own mind on their whatever outlet that is. I mean, more than ever, it's tribal. And I've kind of given up on the idea that this is going to become more popular. Yeah. Me too. And at the same time, then it's important to grow your connections with people that feel like you or like what you might like. And I maybe it takes a little more time for that posse to connect. But as much as I you could scorn social media, it's pretty incredible that musicians in Berlin, young players who love the work of, say, Matt Mitchell in Brooklyn. I've never met Matt. Matt sends them his scores and things like this. So now you've got this cross world community that doesn't even physically know each other, but they admire each other's work. You know, they, they're influenced by what each other are doing. And now the tribe grows in this way, connecting with the guys from Australia that didn't travel in 2005. Yep. But now everyone knows who they are through Facebook and Instagram. Mm. This is interesting to me, and I know this is far away from maybe what we're talking about, but I'm improvising this conversation here with you. Well, it's not really that far away because it is, it's the context within which this kind of music that we're probably talking about, in some, even if we're not directly talking about it, it takes place. You know, the, 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 the audience and the musicians are, as you say, they are a certain tribe and they are people who, I mean, you get this in, it, it, uh, what I found interesting thinking about this book and about what he was saying about predictability, I suddenly realized, actually, do you know what? Most people are like that about everything. They they eat the same food. They go, you know, they 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 go to the same place every year for a holiday. It's it, there's a comfort to human in human human nature. Mm -hmm. There is a comfort in predictability that that is not a kind of thing that, for most things anyway, that I would ascribe to you know i like to go to a different place i like to eat different food i like to play different music and i love i love to be surprised especially in art you know whatever sure. we take yeah. it we take it where we want it i like ritual yeah i'm really right. comfortable with that but not in my yeah. music right not even yeah. in my practice abilities and what i what it's interesting to me to go back to the let's say that you know the jazz guys playing standards and you know the tribal language and how much of that language are you speaking there's another possible side to that which is the story so so you know if you took in the in in ireland they had the 
uh, the Shanaki uh, in Africa, they've had the Griot, they have these guys who tell the same story basically all the time, right? The same story. Everybody knows that story and they still want to hear the guy tell them the story mm -hmm. and how the guy tells the story. Not that he changes or, or she changes the story, but the way they tell it, right, mm -hmm. is hugely important to the to the listeners. And famous Shanakis in Ireland, they made a good, that's what they used to do. They were, they were lives, they were storytellers and they basically went around, they lived, they come to someone's house and they would stay in the house in the village and the villagers would come into the house and he'd tell the stories based on the myths and legends of Irish mythology. And the better they were at doing this, the more food they got and the more houses they could stay in. That was basically, the, that was basically their gig. That's all they did. Same as the griots kept the stories of African, you know, especially having the slave trade and all that stuff. They, they were the people who managed to keep those stories together. So I was thinking about that recently because um, I'm, I'm, you know, for my sins, I'm, I'm doing a PhD and, and uh, I was reading. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, so um, I was reading quite a lot about African music, West African music, and there was a lot of stuff about that, you know, very different ways of thinking. And one of them was around the griots. And then I'm starting thinking, you know, a great player who really plays great swing feel can really play a change and has a great rhythm section and goes up and plays something totally non-original based on that right can can that still i started to go maybe they're just telling those stories you know that's what it is we know the story before he starts mm. he tells it so great that it has value for that reason only it's not that he has become a I, you know because I, would... I, I think what we're talking about is taking our language in the context of that general tribal language and then completely being ourselves within the context where anything can happen hopefully using that language and i'm wondering is there another type of thing here where the improvisation is not actually that big to be honest it's a quotient if we call it that or what's mm -hmm. going what can happen from night to night is actually quite small right but in some ways they're telling a story that we are familiar with and if they are really great at telling that story then maybe that's okay. I think, yes. And then you would, you know, so maybe it, it, it sort of uh, puts the, how much improvisation is actually their question. Maybe we're looking at the wrong art form for this idea of total improvisation, mm. even if that exists. Because as I mentioned before, it's spontaneous composition, which means you're, you know, what is, you're making decisions and is that, you know, even, am I really even ever improvising? I call it improvisation, but mm. basically I'm just using my language. So I make being spontaneous with my, right. So now you're looking at this tribal language by these people, they're on stage, they're telling this story or I'm telling their story. That's a good way to look at it because it does take the pressure off of it for you to reinvent every second. Like don't fool yourself, tell the story. Learn the story and tell it. You yeah, know. And, you know, recently I had two different experiences. Um, one, I came across Christian McBride's trio playing on some, you know, like a broadcast from a radio station or something. And they played a blues, fried pies. And it was just like the Oscar Peterson trio, but it was so good. You know what I mean? It was so right, good. Right. It was so swinging. There wasn't one new thing in it, not one. Mm -hmm. And it was still great for what it was. And great, and then, right? Yeah. And then... On the other hand, the thing for me, one of the highest things in the jazz world, if you want to use the jazz world of all time, is precisely the band you just talked about with Tony Williams Herbie, where they're playing Autumn Leaves. And it's just it's just kind of embarrassing how creative it is. You know, like the way they, they take that story and they twist it and turn it. And it's still that story, but it's like it's kind of mutates into something else every time they play it and i started listening to like miles in berlin from that period miles in berlin miles in antib two miles in antib miles in tokyo and what they do with those things is extraordinary so this was both within the same week and it was really you know because i was thinking about we were going to have this conversation i was really thinking about that you know like i can't say that christopher mcbride's guys are not improvising because they are but the other hand, it's not this, you know, like, and at mm -hmm. the same time, these guys are playing rhythm changes. These guys are playing a blues, but, and they're both playing four, four swing, but it's not the same thing. No, it's, it's radically different in, in approach as well as execution. Mm -hmm. True. True. And I, and I, 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 you would think then there'd be all this room for everyone to do all these things. <laughs> 
you know. <laughs> you lose, <wouldn't> you? <laughs> um, uh, which I would I just to mention the miles thing, you know what? And 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 as I'm looking at bands that have been in, that have been around for 25 years now, you know that that band did not exist for very long. No. When you look at when you look at those dates, especially like the the time. I mean, besides all the albums they were doing in between that band doing live shows we're talking a period of three years. Yeah. I mean, really, it's like like from that 67 European tour, which was a, a fantastic box set to come out with the classic, quint with that second classic quintet. Yeah. Yeah, it's a three year span. Okay, did, 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 did Miles burn out on the vibe? You know, did Autumn Leaves not offer any more sustenance anymore? <laughs> I so it went to this other sound and this other extended thing. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think the door, the door that someone like Bird opens to taking 12 notes mm. and recombining them with this feel in this way, right? The door that that opens. And the, also the same door that like the way that Tony would unhook the standard from itself. Yep. and move it somewhere else along with Wayne and and Miles allowing him to do that or saying, yeah, go do it, you know. Yep. Those those are very, both the way Bird would do it his way and the way that Tony, let's say, would do it his way in Miles's band are such strong suggestions, you know. Yeah, and here's, a, here's an interesting, you know, you know, giant figure, if you like, right? Giant figure. And a, a, a band as a giant figure, Coltrane's Quartet. Right? Mm -hmm. This is the other big beast in the field in those days. True, right? true, absolutely, yeah. right. But yeah. it's very different. You have Train, of course. He and he was a worker out of stuff. You know, there's no question. You know, you can hear it. He, the way he, he he methodically works his way through stuff. But he's definitely improvising. He's trying out shit and he's taking chances and all. But behind that, there's a machine. Right. This is what I think of it. There's a machine, which is there's this rhythm section. I always think of I always think of Miles's group is like a bunch of quicksilver fish, you know, like a shoal of them. They're just like they're, everything's going like this. And yeah. I think Coltrane is like, you know, those when you used to study, well, not study, but we used to learn about in geography, we used to learn about how how icebergs carved the valleys on the mountains right you know mm -hmm. that oh that's how it happened i always think that's the culture and rhythm section they're like a giant they just they just go and it's like it is improvising of course it is but they're telling their story they're telling this story this particular this story, story. Over, and over, over and over again so it's deeper a, and deeper so it's an interesting it's an interesting one because they are contemporaries of that group they are completely one of the some of the greatest improvisers on all their instruments of all time but at the same time it's a completely different approach to what Miles was doing which was all this thing where you know basically it could be radically different it wasn't really radically different night to night with Coltrane's band you know you hear right. and and also if you listen I, you know it's gentler in 1960 and 61 and then if you listen to live recordings by 62 63 and when you get to transition it's so it's it's taken on it's worked out in the gym quite a bit you know oh, no, or 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 the energy that you hear at slugs uh, yeah. or at the five spot whatever yeah. it was yeah. five spot wow and it, it, it i watched again um the you know the famous belgium gig where elvin and they're steaming. It's so cold, you know, that, that video, the commitment to playing favorite things, right? A tune they had to play every night. I mean, every night, like, cause it was the big hit. So he had to play it every night. I'm sure he All liked right, it. Right, right, right. So you're also an entertainer. You're an entertainer. Yeah. He had to play it, but what he does, what they do on that, the, the head of steam literally and figuratively that they get up on that. I just was watching that in a, in a day when I was particularly, uh, uninspired by by lockdown <laughs> and feeling sorry for myself and i watched that and i kind of went what's your fucking problem you know here this these guys are out there freezing their asses off coltrane's a big star you could easily say i'm not playing out there it's too cold my instruments are out of tune are you kidding me i want to play favorite things again no fuck that you know he could so easy and instead they go out and they play like their lives depended on it you know yeah and they're and they're improvising but in a way that a language that they evolved as a tribe of four people in a way, it's kind of interesting because it's, 
it's improvising and it's not you know i don't mean not but it's a different kind of improvising it's it's very interesting how many different ways this can this can be if you know what i mean well and also i hate to say it not to not to not to bring it back to current events but the reason why they were up there playing in the first place is for black men at this time traveling the world having a band you know the the reason how why you know this idea of black american music you know and these are there's a reason for this you know these men represent a reason of something this isn't coming from my family as this thing from the library right <laughs> coming from bellevue washington in the suburbs i mean i discovered it that way and the universal right to fall in love with something and follow what it suggests but you got to wonder maybe why people did what they did you mm -hmm. know which is something i'll never know really really like to go through that process and to get on stage and what does it mean as a black american artist in belgium in the steaming whatever playing my favorite things it has to have a different resonance for those black men than yep. me being college educated yep. decades yep. later yeah you know it would it so sometimes this idea of improvising is actually paying attention to who you are really you know i think like what is your language you know mm. not 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 someone else's not assuming things mm. i mean i'm just i ask this question because because i feel like, like people post videos on social media this idea of now we can just copy so and so you know, like all the work was done for you. Here's the sound. Here's the look. You monkey see, monkey do. It's easy. Mm. You copy it. I mean, and now that's admirable. And one well, like, like, wow, how did you develop Buddy Rich's technique? That's fantastic. You know, lights go off and cash and prizes arrive from drum <laughs> companies to support this. It's kind yeah. of fantastic. On the other hand, not a stitch of that is yours. Yeah. Not a stitch of that is you. It, or at least coming from your, I mean, you know, Rick and Morty, maybe that is the way it is now. We're only going to be mirroring what we see on video. Yeah. That, that I mean, you know what I mean? Like, that oh, be, as, I, as a side joke, but I, no, but I. Yeah, that YouTube thing is like this arid wasteland of shite, you know, being played very fast. It's so awful. And, but at and, the same time, these are humans looking for something. You know, this, these are human, like, they, 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 like some of the philosophies are like, look, you know, everything should close down in a pandemic. I'm going to work my ass off. Here I go. And here, and I'm going to blindly stab at this because I don't know what else to do. And this uh, is I, interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I'd say you, you're, you've uh, more, you're ascribing in a more generous way than I would say. Well, I know. I mean, I only, hey, I. Because I, I see it well, as part of the, I see it as part of the social media thing where everyone wants to be liked, you know, and admired as opposed to trying to explore something. I mean, I'm not saying that nobody's doing it, but there's a huge amount of this now. Oh, uh, no, here's, uh, here's Clifford Brown solo on Cherokee on Kazoo, you know. It's like, <laughs> what the fuck? Well, maybe Kazoo actually be kind of cool. But, um, but you know, not on viola or, you know, whatever the next thing is. It, it's so arid, kind of. And and again, in a way, I, I'm interested to say not one note of that is theirs. So here's an interesting one of the ideas, classical music, because I was listening to an interview with a really great classical pianist the other day. And saying you know about how what was great about music is how these pieces could be radically different from night to night and i'm sitting there going no they can't absolutely not you can play them a little bit louder in that passage than that guy did and maybe a little bit faster but that's it you know you not but when they play the music they're still great ones they make you believe that they wrote that shit you know what i mean they really mm -hmm. do they they make you do but having said that i kind of constantly go between the utmost admiration for classical musicians to kind of going well you know that's none of that's your shit actually you know i i don't care that's, that's care. what none of that none of that stuff is yours just you like know? jazz right yeah but maybe at least in jazz you have a decision to play d before c rather than always c before d right? i would say it's a <laughs> this is an interesting subtlety <laughs> the thing is i would be huh 
It's a, it's a small distinction, but actually a huge one too. It's a huge one, but, but in the same way, do I have the right to get on stage and play, you know, these things like what, maybe, okay. Yeah, classical musician, jazz musician, interpreting these things, improvisation, or what am I really saying? Spontaneous composition is you making stuff up. So there's a, maybe a higher percentage chance that it's your music, maybe, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. You know, and I guess if it, your music is only the language of Charlie Parker, it's going to sound like Bird in some way, very close, and yeah. it might not have the 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 emblem of original music on it. It would be of by and for Charlie Parker, I guess is mm. how you would end up perceiving it. Mm. So this thing of like, if I go back to the band I'm making, why would I make a band that's inspired by late Miles or even, even early Winton because he picked up that torch, that baton started running. And then like, okay, that's okay, bye. <laughs> and then went the other direction. And you yeah. could say that Branford kept running with that, with Tane and Branford and Kenny, you know, they, they, they were like, no, 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 we're good. We'll, yeah. we'll keep going with this. And they went in a direction with it. Well, there's a lot of directions you could still run from that point. Yeah, you know, it's not like Branford finished it for anybody. If anything, it just got more circuitous in terms of like getting into Keith Jarrett's music and the idea of free and other, you know, other things that 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 he found interesting. Other influences, okay, wherever that goes. And he was an entertainer at the same time. He was making big money and touring, and and there, you always have a, a, a some sort of mouth to feed artistically and audience wise. So it's not like it's pure art or something, you know, it's like whatever that would be. But yeah. when you have when you have nothing to lose <laughs> and you're looking at something that's like, okay, where where could I take these things that were created by these people, you know, these musicians, these artists? What can where can I go with this? You know, how much of me and my friends can I put into this? And maybe that's kind of how we how I see what we do you know it's all coming from this sound yeah and it's definitely it's definitely all black american music i mean okay. besides influences from everything else obviously yeah. we can go country to country and culture to culture and name them all but the primary one it's black american music yeah. the it's impetus to improvise in yeah. that manner is coming from that music okay so what else it's, it, 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 it's yeah it's I, um african uh, i saw it described recently and i think it's a good one it's african dna which runs through all the, the D, i think that's a very nice way to put it you know it's, a, it's kind of a dna that runs through uh, all these various multifarious forms of african-american music whether it's from the caribbean or whether from north you know whatever it is and the descendants of all of that stuff as the dna carries on down through it i think it's a mm. really, really good way to um to look at that um there was something I was going to say there when you were talking about that, and I've um, lost just because I was got distracted by DNA. <laughs> you said it's always worth being distracted for the record. You, you yes, a little, you, yeah, you sound a little dubious around the DNA idea, did you? Huh? Were you a little dubious about the DNA idea? What do you mean, dubious? No, I, I, thought, I thought when I was saying that, I thought you were going to go and kind of go, huh, you know, like. Oh, no, no, no. That's a great, great way to put it. I yeah. mean, if you uh, watching, uh, watching some friends talk the other day, uh, giving an interview, they're like, yeah, we also invented rock and roll. We'll take that, too. You know, mm -hmm. a, a black American say, yeah, Little Richard. Hello, all the blues cats, you know, all this stuff like that is rock and roll as well. Like, OK, this is all coming from African yeah, DNA. I mean, the first example I, I found this, I mean, I did a bit of research for teaching the class into white guy. Into, um, into New Orleans music. And, and you know, one of the, the first guy to do on a record to go. There's a rhythm called uh, this rhythm called Tresio, which is which is a kind of a half a habanera basically, and don't go, uh, don't 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 that one. Mm -hmm. And the first guy was a guy who to put that into the rhythm section as opposed to to make bass and drums play that was a guy called Dave Bartholomew, who was a black American arranger, and he he made the first rock and roll record in 1948, and it's in the mm -hmm. rhythm section, and they go. Doom, 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 doom. Like literally that, 
right. it's 1948 guy from new orleans and then all the guys from there little richard uh, all those guys uh, you know that's all that's where that comes from and it's absolutely a rock and roll forget i mean it, it, rock music absolutely new orleans basically and what what people what i i didn't realize is that you know before the revolution the cubans i didn't realize that this you know it's 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 only 90 miles from havana to new orleans and Every day there was a ferry in both directions for up, right up to 1960 or whenever the revolution was. So the influence of Cuban music on New Orleans music and, and the, its entry into the USA proper is, you know, is I, I mean, I knew, you know, we all know, oh yeah, New Orleans is the art, but we don't realize just quite how much it is. And the reason, mm -hmm. one of the reasons is because it is connected to the wider diaspora of the Caribbean via Cuba, really. Right. So it's really, um, it's really interesting. That, that historical stuff, you know, it's fascinating. Billy Hart talks about that when speaking about Billy Higgins, like things that they've talked about, like the connection and you yeah. hear it in the drumming, you hear it. The, so that's so interesting because it, yeah. if you like, explore those- he, said, he, could said, he said, you can tell by their, se their second names. If they got English second names, they come from the islands. You know, so, <laughs> you know, Higgins, Roach, these guys, and they play a certain way because they play the Cascara a certain way. This is this is his great this thing that he said was I love the way he brought it down to your second name. You know, I, I can that's tell by great. your second name how you're gonna play the cascara. And that's a kind of a that's a kind of a deep research that is totally unrecognized in the world of academia. I mean it's a little bit more now, but but generally that kind of to hear a guy speak in that depth of granular, you know, about groove and about how it came about and how those guys play, I mean it's just so heavy. It's it's extraordinary. Um, to, to go back to a point, I remember the point I was going to make. This is a, a knowledge that's passed normally from person to person and band to band. Exactly. You know, and exactly. and and at, I don't even know if the academy can handle that much information. Right. You know, sometimes I, I, to be honest. Yeah, well, they they have their own thing, and I found that out as I try and negotiate the shark infested waters of academia. But that there are certain ways that they want you to write. You know, no matter what. Of course. Um, but but I mean that's interesting is because I'm doing a practice based PhD anyway, so it's I don't have to write huge amounts. But anyway, um, what I was thinking about there was this idea of you know what what can you take and how much do you make it yours and all of that stuff. You know what, um, uh, that was an interesting one for me because I spent quite a few years as what they call in German, for us it makes us well, definitely made me uncomfortable. An expert, we call it an external examiner, which I think is much better. Anyway, mm -hmm. I spent a, a lot of time in Lucerne as, oh, as the expert. Ex yeah, as an expert, as an external examiner, and I watched all masters um, concerts for fourteen years. I must have seen three or four hundred concerts of young musicians, mostly very good young musicians, and doing and because it's Lucerne, which is a very you know I'm sure you've been there. It's a very open kind of place, so there was all kinds of stuff. And so I'd have to try and sometimes. And you'd be you had to give feedback to the guys immediately after the gig, you know, and it was very tough for them too. I thought I have so it was nice in some ways, but also kind of rough, you know. You're finished the gig, asking was three guys sitting behind the table telling you, you suck or not, as the case may be. Anyway, but you didn't fulfill the requirements of something. Exactly. Although that the requirements were pretty loose in there, I have to say, you know. So so that was and it was masters, which is how it should be, you know. Right. But anyway, occasionally, of course, I would come across people who really just sounded or tried to sound like other people. You could, it was so clear, it was so, you know, you you know, trying to sound like your heroes, absolutely. To them. And I was trying to find a way to say that to them, you know, in a way that was kind of not insulting because a lot, some of their heroes were great players and to just to be able to emulate their heroes was representative of so much work, you know what I mean? Like sure, to, to get them to speak together and all that shit. And so what I would say to them was, I think what you showed me was who you love, but what I'd love to have heard is who you are. And that was as close as I could get to differentiating that thing of complete emulation. It's like saying, have you read this book? It's great. And do you know that guy? He's great. And, you know, but then, but so that's what you're doing is you're handing over a list of stuff that you love. But at the end of it, all the person, the recipient knows is I know what you love, but who who are you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and i would i would try and put it in a way of say well if you were writing a book would you try and write a book you know i, I and would you say to me i've written a book and it really is like hemingway it's written in exactly the same style 
you know, like, <laughs> which is what it is, right? That's that's what I know, is. I know. And when you phrase it like that, it takes on a different meaning. It does. Sure. So, so I've, I've done all those short sentences and that kind of punctuation he did. It's exactly like Hemingway. And I would probably say to you, well, that's kind of fucking weird. <laughs> you know, it's like kind of weird. So, but we do this in music and we were, you know, you know, you know, people do it. And, you know, I, I certainly, when I was starting out, I was trying to sound like the guys I was playing with. There's no question. They were so much better than me. You know, I was basically terrible, but they, and they really could play, you know, and I was definitely trying to play like them. And of course there were periods I went through, you know, obsessions with various players as one does. And then I just kind of figured it out somehow. And I think working with certain people helped me a lot, you know, and certainly going to Banff was a huge thing for me. It was gigantic, you know, right. because Right. Because you were there with Kenny Wheeler and Coleman and Dave Hall and George Lewis was there the first year. I mean, it was like, you know, you were just faced with all these people who were resolutely themselves, right? Resolutely themselves, and that puts it up to you. Then you start; it starts to feel kind of foolish, you know, if you're if you're trying to play like somebody and the guy that you're who's on who's taken the ensemble doesn't sound like anybody else except themselves, and it kind of it kind of made you or made me you know aware of the importance of personal voice at that point you know right and 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 you know to 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 shut down your tennis analogy uh guys that would make the tennis without a net analogy when you look at those people you just mentioned in banff obviously steve coleman george lewis kenny wheeler i mean they're totally them and at the same time, they're completely coming from a place where tennis was played. Absolutely. With a net. Absolutely. Like with, they're tennis with, masters, basically. With, the yeah. highest, with some of them with the highest fucking net you've ever seen. You know? Exactly. Well, yes. And that's, and of course that gets that, that, um, and that terrible idea that you have to do something musically to let the people know you can really play, which is such a jazz awful jazz trope oh, dreadful. Spouse, dreadful. still in universities by certain teachers well, yeah, um, well, it was, you also see it even within the tradition you see people like, did you ever hear that story about monk that apparently one night some guys were with him and he played exactly like bud powell i mean he could yeah, really, yeah. Do, he could really, he could really do, play oh he could really play it was no, the, i mean it, no. it's 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 this kind of it that is a classical uh that's the kind of thing you get in classical music, you know, that there's a specific way to play and any other way is wrong. Um, so it's a really horrible anti-personal, personal, anti-improvisational trope. You know, it's really mm -hmm. a dreadful one. And you get it not only in that, that the free guy, or, you know, I mean, I remember being stunned when, um, <clears throat> I'd say not for any, not that I even thought about it, but in Banff, we were having a jam session one day with Coleman and George Lewis came in and played the living shit out of confirmation. I mean, the living shit out of it. Melody, everything on the trombone. It's like, right, right. Being, You're like, what? what? <laughs> it was really, and it was so kind of on, you know, it was no, maybe, he, yeah, can I play? Yeah, yeah. He said, what are you playing? And she was, let's play confirmation. He said, okay. You know, it wasn't like, oh shit, you know, I'll show you. It was just like, yeah, this I was kind of fun, you know? And, um, it was really a lesson in in actual does it it doesn't really matter you know the stylistic shit doesn't matter the stylistic shit is only important in so far as you need it to express what it is you need to express whatever that is well yet yeah, academia is based upon style you know mm -hmm. teaching known things i mean where's the academy that just teaches the unknown or the unheard you know, or the totally yeah. spontaneous. Where is that academy? Yeah. Where does that live? Well, I think the academy, the problem with the academy is, uh, speaking of someone who teaches them one, <laughs> but is that they are total compromised in order to educate the many. That's really what it is and to fit within a semesterized system. So you basically say to you, need to know X information in Y amount of weeks. And at yeah. the end of Y amount of weeks, we will check to see if you know that information. Right, exactly. This would explain the standards laws at jazz exactly. colleges. Exactly. They have no other way to judge them. Exactly. And to, and to see if they, they develop craft or whatever it is. I mean, the ideal way to learn is in small, either one-on-one -on -one with someone who's a guru, basically like an Indian right. style, 
and you go to them and they say to you, here's some information, go away and come back when you're comfortable with that information and let's have a look at it again. That's the best way because this guy, I mean, I know this from my own students, that guy is really good at composition, but his time is kind of squirrely. That guy plays incredible, but he can't figure out harmony from, from a hole in the wall. You know what I mean? People can be very talented musically, but the, but the way they're talented musically can be radically different within from one person to another. How they, sure. Some guys have great organizational minds. Other guys have got, you know, they're just totally spontaneous. Other guys got ridiculous time for no reason than, other than they have. You know, it's not like they're, they're like the kids who run faster than the other kids at the under 400 meter dash. You know what I mean? Right. There's right. no reason. They're not in training. Their DNA makes them do that. So, so the, but unfortunately, the academy, uh, ac academy says, well, you're all the same and you should all know the same information in the same number of times. So it's, it, it is a compromise that allows large numbers of people access to information. I, that's, mm -hmm. that's the best I can say for it. And within that, context hopefully you they will meet teachers who are genuinely inspiring to them and help and of course they'll meet their fellow students which is the most important thing of all they're, yeah. they're in a community for four years and i think that i think the value of that community is, becomes more and more strong as it kind of gets harder and harder to have that community outside oh i am i i believe in the academic structure i would well, that the academy let's say that the mm. acad not academic academy yes this is actually could be the best years of their artistic lives perhaps mm. now in the right academy with the right people and the right students and this combination and this creativity and this fusion of all these things and then because the real world you know outside of maybe this experience mm. Yeah, I maybe. Mean, I mean, I know, this idea I know, of playing for you. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of the guys Sorry. that you work with, or you're not a lot of the guys, but a lot of your contemporaries, like, you know, you met them in, in school, right? I mean, you know, the, those, um, like Kurt and those guys. Sure. And that, that, that story is replicated thousands of times all over the world in the, in the jazz community. You know, Lionel Luekis group's the most common, you know, the most obvious example now, you know, of, of a big name guy. You know, his guys were the guys he met in Berkeley. You know, he's got a, you know, Swedish bass player and a Hungarian drummer and a guy from Benin. In, in a way, they're almost like an example of what can happen, you know, meet the right guys. And and, and you, you develop your community often from the four year, four intense years you spend mm -hmm. in that environment. And often it's a shock to them when they leave. They're, they can't wait to get out. But when they get out, it's kind of like uh, nobody actually cares whether I practice except me now <laughs> yeah, it's like because that's that's the thing you know there's there's we were i i yesterday um in, in our school i got i convened a meeting of the entire not the entire but anybody who wants to come up the teaching staff and the students because just it's so difficult now people are you know feeling very separate and all that and i was trying to I thought it'd be great for us just to hang out for an hour and a half and just talk about stuff, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just hang and just say, you know, how you're feeling, you know, what's, you know, and we, and it was really interesting. The teachers, a couple of the teachers said to the students, you don't know how lucky you are having assessments coming up because it gives you something to work towards. And they're all saying, we've got nothing to work towards. We've got no gigs. We've got no nothing. It's so right. hard. To, it's so hard to be motivated under those right. circumstances. But, and so I think for some students, even though the teachers, you know, might seem like a pain in the ass to them. And no, oh, he's going to give me shit if I don't practice that. Somehow when they leave the school, they often go, actually, nobody cares. If... I've said that a couple of times to guys, you know, you do need to understand this. Once you leave school, almost nobody will ever care if you take that saxophone out of its case ever again, except you. So you need to think about that. That's kind of brutal, but it's kind of true, actually true, you know. They, well, they, as, as as Reiner Temple, who I'm working with here with the oh, big yeah. band, say hello, week, say hello to, please say hello I will to for me. sure. Yeah. Yeah. We were yeah. talking about the need of the academy and all this stuff, because I was wondering if maybe now in pandemic times and there's so many jazz schools in Germany, even though Reiner kind of set me straight with the population of Germany and the need for that many schools mm. compared mm. to, say, like the population of America and how many schools are there. Like, it's interesting. Um, 24 jazz schools in Germany isn't is still an okay number for 90 million people. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's like, whoa, all right. Yeah. I understand the numbers now. The thing is, uh, 
I always was afraid that that after they sort of did that poll in Germany about what does a jazz musician earn? Mm -hmm. This was a couple of years ago. Did you hear about that? They sort of did a survey yeah. about how what a jazz musician's career is and how much they make and all these things. And it was, and it basically really what it was was to go to the artistic community in a place like Berlin and go, we know you need help. Here's some more help. Right. Versus in America where it would be more like, okay, you're not producing money, we'll shut you down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. the American here is still getting used to being in Europe. It's a very different mindset. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Reiner was mentioning the universities to my point um, because there's, it's science. Music education is like science. It's something yeah. you study and it's good for humans. It's, it's good to have. It doesn't mean you have to do it when you leave. You know, it's yeah. information. It's just like any other study of something. And he used the word science. I don't know if that translates in English the same way, but but it, but it probably does because you know a very interesting thing that you make that point because I read this book recently. I don't know if you, you know this. You know Ted Gioia. You know this this mm -hmm. writer who wrote. The, he's written a book called Music: A Subversive History, which is very interesting, and he he it's 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 really a very different approach to the history of music and he, he's making the point that you know music musicians were always outsiders and they gradually their history has always been that they've been outsiders who once they make a reputation for themselves as outsiders are incorporated and become insiders right and that the, and that the big thing it's really fascinating but one of the one of the most interesting things he talks about is the fact that before pythagoras and the idea of music as science music was considered as magic it was not considered. It was considered magic, and 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 the the, the keepers of music and the, were generally shamanistic people, you know, shamans and all of that kind of stuff. And um, he talked about this extraordinary. Um, I never knew this. You know, these lasso caves in France where they had the cave paintings. Yes. Um, well, a, a guy in the I don't know if you know this, but I didn't know this. A guy in the eighties, only as recently as the eighties, he, he he also had a side sidebar of being interested in the acoustics of cathedrals right but he was a he was an archaeologist as well and he was in the biggest cave and he suddenly realized he used to home around just as he's going around he suddenly realized that the acoustic in front of the of the paintings was the best in the whole cave and the closer he got the better the sound got it was amazing and so he started to think about this and he went to all the other caves and he found exactly the same thing in every cave right that wherever wow. the, wherever the paintings are is the best sound the rever reverberation is the best so they from this they've come to to realize that people probably came and sang at these paintings you know to the paintings or at them or around mm -hmm. them and everything every image that's on those there's only two there's apparently only two um kind of uh human beings represented it in the whole all of those paintings they're all animals and they're animals that these people hunted so they they reckon they probably either got there to to before they went hunting to sing to get get the oxytocin going and get the you know and get the, the ship because hunting in those days is incredibly dangerous it wasn't yeah. just the, yeah it wasn't just the, you know a mammoth might kill you it was like if you got a scratch from a thorn you could die from blood poisoning if you broke your ankle you'd probably be left behind to starve you know it was like it was really dangerous so so the idea of this communal connection via music in prehistoric times, you know, uh, is really a very interesting one. You know, this idea of the use of, of music as because so much music now, if we talk about we were talking about improvisation and which is really collective, you know, we're talking about collective music making mostly. Um, the idea so much music now is just considered either nostalgia Oh, I remember when I was going out, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, mm -hmm. that song brings me back, blah, blah, blah. Or it's entertainment, right? Lifestyle the, music, yes. Yeah. But the idea, that, the idea of it as magic is fascinating because, not because we never thought that, but maybe maybe we didn't in the sense of just thinking it like a guy, you know, it is it is the creation of magic, literally. And he, he mentions the fact that every developed civilization and, and, you know, uh, over history, pretty much every one of them has a story where a guy goes into the underworld armed only with a musical instrument or a tune and defeats the forces of darkness and rescues the fair maiden or whatever it is, you know, magic flute, Mozart, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. you know, it, and, and in Hindu mythology, they have it in Greek mythology, they have it in Egyptian mythology, they have it. So the idea up to the point where Pythagoras and those guys said, oh, actually, well, this is the overtone series and it's a science it was thought of as being magic and so he i thought that was a really interesting 
thing about that, you know, because it still has that magic. But these days, so much of that magic is sidelined by other considerations. You know what I mean? I mean, your students feeling like we have nothing to do, you know, I mean, that's the opposite of how a lot of my younger friends are feeling right now. They're more concerned about where they, the ones that are graduating are more concerned about where they're going to go. Mm. And they look at Instagram as a model of like, should I be doing that? Yeah. Because other uh, person B, C, D are having a great success. So it looks doing this. So they're worried about that. Uh, if you go to the musical thing, there's no, they're, they're not, these people are not worried about that. They're right. not going to drop music simply because it isn't in fashion or in season right now. Yeah. They're, they're as bad as me or how yeah. I've had it. Or maybe I got lucky and it was offered to me as a lifestyle and a way to make money. And so now I find myself here at the end of the rainbow and you still can't tear music away from me, you know, nor yeah. you. Yeah. And yeah, so we, maybe, maybe we didn't consider it in the same way. I didn't. I no. just, it wasn't, not in, it was not, wasn't that I didn't consider it, but it was not a, a thing that I ever thought about. It was that I play music. That's, yeah. That's and there was, in, in the, in, you know, I mean, I grew up playing in, in weddings and stuff like that, like uh, right out of high school, in high school. And I could see it was possible to make money playing music. That's a very simple idea. If yeah. you want to be an entertainer, there's money. So mm -hmm. you're good. Start there. You know, yeah. and it, it, it turned into this artistic thing and this pursuance of uh, my fantasies later on. And I could find a way to generate income like that. Yeah. But for a lot of them, they've got the fantasies, they've got the music, they've got the ideas. I don't know how, where they're going to land something per se. Mm. But one with and not stick with it outside of college in this way. Yeah, it's it's a it's a hard question to answer. And you know, I of course I have to go sometimes and do open days where people are there with their you know kids and, and a lot often you've told me about this you've yeah. told me these things yeah no this is but, okay but there's, a, but there's oh. a good point there's a good point about this right and the question i always say to the kids because they come up my, my mother says it's no career in music career 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 and i always say and i actually got this from larry monroe from berkeley he said it years ago and i thought it was a great thing he said don't ask do you want a career in music ask do you want a life in music do you want a life in music? Right. No. And he life says, and, music, and yeah. I think that's a great, and I always use that now when I'm talking to young people. I say, look, look, I say, if, if you're coming up from the point of career, you're in the wrong, come the wrong way. Because really, as I always say, we're living in, in this European, the city that has the European headquarters of Google, Facebook, all these people, you could definitely get a career with those guys. There's no question you can get a career. That's if right. you want a career, go there because that's yeah. where they're offering is. careers. They have it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and but if you want, if you say, well, will I have a career in music? That's the wrong question. Right. The question is, do you want to have your life in music? And I always give them the 20 year question. I'll say, you know, what time is it now? And we'll always say it's like 10 past 10 on Monday morning. I say, well, how old are you? And they're going on 19. I say, well, guess what? If everything's OK in 20 years time at 10 past 10 on Monday morning, you're going to be 39 years of age. You're going to be nearly 40. I know that's impossible to believe, but that's what's going to happen. And let's imagine it's 10 past nine on Monday morning and you're 39 years of age. What do you want to be doing today? And if you, if the answer to that is music, well, then you got to think, then you got to do whatever it's necessary to get to that point. And that's really the way to think about it. That's a, that's a, that's really good advice. I, I don't, have those quite those stories in my mind all the time when the young ones are looking at me what do we do <laughs> but i can see that they're open-minded to you know if we're talking about improvisation they're open-minded to improvising solutions and improvising things yeah. uh yeah. creative ways to to make and do and um not knowing the future of venues and governmental support as they as culture takes another hit perhaps for different reasons um, the return of the house concert in New York City, a fantastic mm -hmm. phenomenon. I would say about 10 years ago, it reappeared and, and some of the best shows I saw in New York before I left were unfortunately, and I do mean unfortunately, in houses because they were fantastic, packed with people, the vibe was great, even free tacos for everybody. Like people lost money hosting their events, you know, and that's what I mean, like, wow, okay, yeah. but the music was so good. I mean, this could have been on any stage anywhere, 
but it's happening in houses. And in a certain sense, like, right. Why is that still yeah. a memory? Why is that one still in my head compared to all the other things I've seen and paid for, maybe? Yeah. You yeah. know, or streamed. Like, why is that one in the head? Because it just was a fantastic time. Yeah. In a house. Mm. So maybe the house is the new club. Maybe the new concert hall is the club. You know, yeah. And our expectations of money and all these things have to shift to work according with that. Yeah. And I mean, the idea of the concert hall being available or, or like a concert being available to average people is less than 100 years old maybe maybe 100 years because before that you were talking about rich people the only people who went to concerts to see, sit down and hear music the way music was heard was in people's houses right on the street right you salons mean, yeah exactly salons all that stuff and, it, and it was in new orleans yeah i mean and in other other societies it was you know the music was played as in two, india would be a great example there's two you know now there's three types there's bollywood as well but but in the old days there were two types. There was classical music, which almost nobody heard except rich guys, right? You know, those they were in the palaces of the moguls. That's where it was developed. And and maybe maybe some more of that in the south where it was based on rich religious ritual as well. So the Carnatic music maybe is closer connection to regular people. But then there's this huge thing of folk music, which was the music of the people. And everybody did that. And that was guys playing in their houses and playing. And, and so and, and Irish traditional music is still played either in the corner of a bar or in somebody's house 90 percent of it right so right. Right. flamenco flamenco in spain in a small yeah. bar yes. you know, people. where else would so, it make sense exactly what, the beauty of so, going to an intimate location to see this and to be part right. of physically what this is it wouldn't work even in a concert hall it would become yes. like some disney world stuff or something yeah and and i think that that idea is maybe is hopeful because if we realize that the idea of, that we're used to, which is you go to a gig or you go to a concert, you buy a ticket, you sit down, is is only a hundred years old at most. And and the previous forty thousand years, because the first instrument they ever found was forty thousand years ago, and it was in the time of the Neanderthals. Check that out. So even the Neanderthals wanted music pre Homo sapiens. There's a thigh bone of a bear they found in Scandinavia, I think, forty thousand years old. It's the oldest ones with holes poked in it for for wow. Years. Wow. So, so for 40,000 years, that's the way the music has been for the last hundred, it's been gigs. So, so, so we're going back to a rich tradition before that, you know, a very, a very long tradition, I guess. Let me ask you one more thing. Cause I guess we probably, if we make this, we should huge, not, not, not destroy people's minds. Um, going I think on. that I feel, and I, I'd be interested to see what you feel about it is what I noticed in, in, in is that life in because of technology and because of all of that life has become and the expectations that ex, that that technology has placed on people in terms of how they look who they are what they do it's da, 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 that actually improvisation and the freedom to make decisions especially for young people has become tremendously circumscribed in the last 10 and 15 years i'm not saying they can't make decisions but the 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 pressure to conform is so so strong now than it was when i was a teenager i mean it's not that you know i, I think about i give you a small example when i was a teenager i would go out in the summer if i was off school my mother would literally say famous saying get out from under my feet come back at lunchtime right and off i'd go and i'd make a decision to call for johnny or whoever and I'd mm. do whatever I did. And she had no idea where I was. I was told certain places not to go and certain people. Right, right. Of course. But ultimately, she had no control over that once I walked out the door. Right. Yeah. Now, 15-year-old kid, 12-year-old, 13, uh, I'm going to call for Johnny. Uh, hang on. I'll just ring Johnny's mom and make sure that it's okay. Right. And have you got your phone? You know, and I do. So the kids, they're grown up under 24-hour watch. Right. Right. And they're not allowed to make any decisions because I noticed this, the difference between the students who are coming into first year now and the ones who are coming in 10 years ago are very different. Oh, they, wow, they, yeah. They're very difficult. They find it very hard to take initiative of any kind. They, it's top down all the time. They're suddenly spat out of the secondary school system and they go over 18 years of age. So we're not even allowed to talk to their parents because it's, it's a data protection thing. You can't talk to the parents, even though the parents try. Listen, I was talking to, uh, you know, Johnny seems to be, you know, so I can't talk to you about Johnny because he's over 18. You know, I'm sorry, but 
well, I, I had this recently. I was talking to somebody. It's like, I said, I can't talk to you, but I, I'm happy to talk to him. And then she gets back and goes, yeah, that he will talk to you. What time would be a good time for you to meet him? You know, the mother. It's like, you know, anyway. Um, so, so I find improvisation, let's take that as a thing, you know, that mm. the idea of being spontaneous and improvising is, is more difficult for young people now because their lives are so much more under the microscope of behaving in a certain way and doing certain things, having certain technology, wearing certain clothes. I mean, I know that's always been the way to some degree, but it's particularly now, and I don't know how you feel about that, but that's that's kind of my feeling. On oh, it. that's, I mean, this is sort of the shock I saw when I went back to my old high school and I was looking at the kids in the big band. You know, these are the, these are the children of my former classmates in this big band. Right. And we were like wild animals compared to these kids. Yeah, yeah. Like you could just see that we were like vicious compared to these little innocents, you know, and maybe they have their own weird issues or fetishes or something that, but you won't, you don't see it or hear it in the music. Not yeah. one personality stuck yeah. out. Even when you're handing them the ball, they're like, I know. <laughs> it's like, like you don't know how to improvise with people. Yes. You don't really, really know how to interact yet. These yeah. are 17 year olds, you know, 15 to 17. I know. Uh, yeah, so that's they, like, I think maybe maybe the big change happens when they leave the helicopter parents um, for whatever maybe necessary reason. I mean, you know, <laughs> I didn't grow up that way. So I, I had total freedom. Yeah. Complete. Well, the other I mean, issue is that they're never given freedom to make a mistake. Because oh, that's too. Because right. they have not only yeah. the helicopter parents, they have what are called the snowplow parents, right? So who are plowing the snow and don't worry. And, you know, don't worry, everybody. No, you didn't lose. Everybody's a winner, you know? So, right, right, so, right, right, right. so right. Prepar preparation for disappointment is removed from their lives because they, because parents don't feel they should ever be disappointed. So they will do everything they can. Whereas the actual ability, you know, eventually you are going to be disappointed. That's, that's the reality. Something's not going to work out for you. And you, you, you know, I think we got a bit more preparation for that, you know, because well, that's what I was going to say. So musician parents are probably the ones that should be making more musicians. Like the musician parents are always surprised when their children want to play music. I mean, yeah, but look at your life. Right. No, it has dynamics. Yeah. Interesting. Absolutely. You've already allowed them the things that make them an improviser, you know, the yeah. way you're, you were allowed this to happen. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Because you were expected to not be under, and my mother, not to be under her feet, quote unquote, get out yeah. from my feet, you know, do, well, I don't care what you do, but don't come back here till lunchtime. Just don't go and get drowned or something like that. But otherwise, you can do pretty much right. what you like. I remember um, a, a story that, my brother uh, Connor had from from a class from a couple of years ago where he was teaching them a James Brown tune he brought in his music they talked to James Brown he said let's do it again next week so he comes back again next week and goes Did anyone check out the original you didn't tell us to <laughs> <laughs> you know it's sad in a way but you know I think I I do think what we do in terms of improvising and and just being personal, you know, come in, in a group of people improvising with each other is, you know, and I know this sounds kind of grandiose, but I think it's more important than it's ever been. Oh, for sure. Ab absolutely. If we expand it like that before, if we were talking about marginalized musics before and all those things, what we're really talking about is the, just the uh, unbelievable need for this kind of energy. Yeah. right now yeah. everywhere yeah. In, in in everything we do yeah i think that's a great note to finish on right there well I'll yeah just, yeah i'll, I'll just improvisation. do improvisation <laughs> just stay where you are for a minute i'll just undo the record so we can say what we really think nice about. chatting ronan yeah you too just hang on. With audience yes for the and thank you whoever's listened to this thank you for yeah e thank you for please e thank you dropping. and uh i'm just gonna Stop this now. Just give me one second. Uh...